three-year fixed mortgages versus variable rates. What are What's going to happen with interest rates? Are they going to be cut and by how much and when? And how do you handle mortgage renewals? All this and more in my podcast that I did today with Dave LaRock. Dave is a frequent guest of Island B. I try to get him back as frequently as I can, I can because I love how he's able to take complex financial information and stuff on mortgage rates and on the market and really simplify it down so that it's really approachable and understandable. And I always get Dave to share how he communicates that to his clients, which is pure gold. You're going to want to listen to this probably a couple of times and take a few of the segments out of this. So in this episode, I cover about uh, will the Bank of cut Canada cut rates? So when this is recorded, it's actually the day before rate cuts. So we'll see what happens. Uh, what does the lower rate means for borrowers? What are variable versus fixed in this market? How Dave has about a third of his clients are opting for variable rates. Does not mean asterisks, does not mean that you should be too. It's just a, and he explains his rationale and on some of that. We talk about how to talk to your clients about the renewal, how he manages his clients' renewals as if it was he was taking care of his mother's mortgage, but he still gets lots of business from them. And how he shares his database marketing strategy that he uses that's super simple, but works like crazy. So it's the, probably one of the simplest database marketing strategies that I've seen, but it works because it's so specific. To connect with Dave, you can find him on his blog. Click on this link, type in Dave Rock. You can uh, go subscribe. I encourage you to check out his blog. Hey, I'm Scott Peckford. This is the I Love Mortgage Brokering Podcast. And thanks for listening. As you know, this is the podcast designed specifically for, for mortgage brokers. And our whole goal is to help uh, you make a better mortgage business. And I absolutely love doing these shows. I love these conversations with people like Dave and the amazing people that I've got to meet over the years. We're coming up on our 10-year anniversary, which is pretty exciting. We'll have to do something for that. I'll keep keep your ears peeled on that. We'll do some sort of a big event around the 10-year anniversary. In any case, uh, before we jump into this episode, I want to give a shout out to our title sponsor, Finmo. Finmo is a Canadian mortgage application, document collection, submission platform designed specifically for Canadian borrowers. It's very easy for borrowers to use. It's got cool features like smart docs. It knows the docs your client needs based on how they fill out the app. It's got smart submission notes, so it knows what pulls key data from the application for the notes that you send to your lender. And it's connected to Lender Spotlight, which is the best tool for searching rates and guidelines. I think there's over 8,000 at last count. Check them out at lendesk.com slash Finmo and check out this conversation with Dave. Hey, Dave, welcome back to the show. Hi, Scott. Good to be here. I always love talking to you, man. You can take complex interest rates and market stuff and you make it simple. And I always say, tell me like I'm 10 and you're like, perfect. I can, I can, you can dump stuff down. So how's it going? Good. Good. So, uh, you know, one of the unique things that I found about my conversation, you got a fantastic blog. We'll make sure we have a link to it in the, in the, uh, show notes for this. If you want to go check out your writing, cause you have some great stuff, but it's technical, but you can communicate it in a way that people get. So maybe the first thing I want to jump into is, Tell me about interest rates kind of right now we're recording this before the next announcement. So I'd like to hear what your thoughts are on that and then what, how that's going to affect, you know, borrowers as well as brokers. What do you kind of see? Well, I, I came down uh, in my most recent post. I, I offered the view that the bank Canada was going to cut tomorrow when it meets by a quarter percent. I think that'll happen. The bond market thinks there's about a 70% chance. Um, We've had the latest uh, GDP data. It came out last week and said that the economy had slowed by more than expected. The Bank of Canada thought in the first quarter, we see quarter over quarter growth of 2.8%. It actually came in at 1.7. The CPI numbers were down. The last CPI data, we had both of our core inflation measures, which the bank says it watches most closely, are now back below 3%. If we back out shelter costs from uh, the consumer price index, uh, we get uh, 1.6. We're below 2%. Now, people say, well, you can't cherry pick. You, you have to take the CPI for all it's worth. Well, the reality is um, other central banks don't use the same weightings that we do for things like, well, some of them don't even count mortgage interest costs. And then when it comes to shelter costs, they use lower weightings. So when we normalize how we measure inflation with other developed economies, um, right. We'd be 2% or better right now. Now, the bank um, is probably still concerned because its last consumer and business survey showed that expectations of inflation were still high. We won't see another, uh, we won't see the next round of consumer and business surveys until early July. So um, they don't have everything lined up the way they want, but they always say we need to skate where the puck is going. And when you look at what's happening in the economy, um, Inflation is cooling. The economy is slowing. Uh, lenders are increasing their loan loss provisions for, for, for default rates, which are rising. Credit card utilization rates and line of credit utilization rates are now uh, moving higher. And that's a sign that people are having more trouble making ends meet. Only about half of Canadian mortgages have renewed thus far. 
And interestingly, Scott, the half that have renewed have gone from rates of about three and a half percent up to rates in the low five percent range. The half of mortgage Canadian mortgage borrowers who have yet to renew got pandemic rates. So they're going to be renewing rates that were two percent or better up to five and a quarter. So the slowing we've seen in the economy right now is basically uh, uh, in part due to mortgage renewals being higher. That's the lag effect of the BOC's rate increase that we talk about. Um, the half that have renewed thus far have uh, seen increases that are, are not nearly as substantial as the increases waiting for the people who have yet to renew. Um, the employment market had a strong, we had 90,000 jobs last month. Everyone freaked out about that. But here's an important thing to consider. So, okay, is that high or low? Well, I'm like, just going to give you some context. So yeah. we have record levels of immigration. And with all the people, the new people we're bringing into the country, and by the way, I love immigration. I think it's great for our country. We need immigration. We don't have enough uh, naturalized Canadians to keep our population pyramid um, from inverting. And, and we need we need taxpayers to support an aging population. So all in favor of immigration overall. But we're bringing people in at such a rapid pace. Our economy needs to create 60,000 new jobs each month just to absorb all the new immigrants we're bringing in. Now, last month, we created 90,000 uh, new jobs. So, you know, check mark for that month. But the average over the last 12 months has been 31,000 new jobs created. So when you look at the economy, uh, when you look at the labor market from a supply and demand standpoint, over the last 12 months, we've added a lot more labor supply than there has been demand to soak it up. So people freak out when they, we get these big headlines and these monthly results. But you have to, t you have to pull back as the Bank Canada will do for context and say, what is the long-term trend in employment? And the long-term trend is we have easing conditions. We have increased labor supply. We have reduced demand, fewer job vacancies, lower quit rates. People quit their jobs when they're confident they can find new jobs. When, when the percentage of people quitting goes down, that's a sign that employees are less confident about their job prospects. There's all kinds of measures that indicate that the labor market is in fact cooling, regardless of the fact that we did have a strong headline last month. And by the way, there are lots of revisions that are happening after the fact. So just because the initial headline for last month was 90K, doesn't mean that's where it'll land a couple of months from now after the revisions are done. Once they've actually counted the ballots, if you will. Yeah. And uh, so, yeah, we just on that note with people leaving jobs, like we just posted for uh, underwriting coaches and we've never had as many quality applicants as we've ever seen. Like it's crazy that the, quality and number of applicants is higher than we've seen it. So that tells me you're right. People don't leave jobs now. They're like, there's a shortage of, yeah. Anyway, so that's, that's interesting. Okay. So what, I want to ask about CPI for a second. So CPI, how has it changed over time? Because there's, you said that every country has their own version of this. And so we're kind of measuring different things, but how has the, as Canada changed what they actually, the, the bucket of things they put in there, the basket, or has it yeah. always been the same? Yeah, well, they have to. I mean, in back in 1980, to give you an extreme example, back in 1980, the Bank of Canada would have tracked the cost of VCRs. Um, we don't have VCRs anymore. So at some point, right. they had to stop counting the cost of VCRs, and then it was DVD players, and now they don't count them at all. So the CPI basket needs to be constantly revised. Um, but, uh, and, and that's a, that's a normal thing. One of the, one of the arguments that people make when they say, well, inflation is actually much higher now because when we use old measures, the, the result is double what the, what the CPI says it is today. Well, the argument is, okay, well, you know, a computer may cost a little bit more than it used to cost, but it's a hundred times more powerful. So there's a lot of subjective, um, uh, right. calls that have to be made about how to measure and weight things. The point I'm making there about shelter costs is simply that in Canada, uh, for example, uh, the, the most egregious difference between how we measure inflation and how other countries measure inflation is mortgage interest costs. Um, mortgage interest costs in Canada are now, they've increased by, I think it's about 30% year over year. And, and that is causing inflation to, to, to look much higher than it would otherwise be. Well, mortgage costs are higher because the bank can't have cranked up its policy rate. When the bank can right. cuts its policy rate, mortgage costs are going to go down. And if the bank can is worried about inflation and saying, we're not going to start cutting rates until inflation cools. Well, as soon as they cut rates, one of the main drivers, of they're, they're actually going to, they're going to drive it. They're going to drive it. It's going to go down. So a lot of central right. banks look at that and say, 
Mortgage interest costs are a direct result of, of what we do with rates. And as a result, we're not going to count them when we measure inflation because we know that as soon as we raise or, or lower rates, that is an inflation in the economy. That's well, it is inflation in the sense that it's higher cost for borrowers, but we directly control that. So uh, we're going to back that out and we're going to measure the stuff that is responding to monetary policy that is that uh, on a secondary basis and is not directly caused by it. Right. OK, so. You said that there's like a 70 percent chance the bond market's predicting a rate cut. And so what what is your like, you know, again, you, like you always say, you can't see around corners. But what what is your sort of expectation? And then my follow up question is, how is this going to affect the average borrower? Because a lot of times we hear this news cycle, but we're news hype. But like we actually what does it mean? Like, yeah. why, why does it matter? How does it matter to me as a, a borrower? Sure. Well, as I said, I think we'll get a quarter point cut. Um, the Bank of Canada's uh, rate cuts occur with a lag, just like their rate hikes do. And if they see slowing in the economy, basically they needed inflation to cool sufficiently in order to be able to, to cut. And as soon as inflation had cooled sufficiently, and in my assessment, it has at this point, they said, we're not going to wait till it goes all the way to 2%. We want it to be on a clear path back to 2%. And I think there are right. enough indicators now that show the economy is slowing. And again, Half of Canadians have yet to renew their mortgages and those that half of the Canadians are going to see a bigger payment shock and have to bridge a wider gap between their current mortgage rate and the new rates. So basically, if I'm the Bank of Canada, all the momentum suggests there will be further slowing in the economy and inflation is is, is going to hit 2% again. So the question now is, what do we do today so that 12 months, 18 months from now, uh, we, we don't end up having over tightened and we don't slow the economy too much. And that's why I think they're going to cut now. Because, yeah, they don't want to have to cut the other direction and be like, oh, shoot, we've overcorrected and now we've got to cut rates again because that creates just more swings in. Right. Yeah. And, they, yeah. and, and history says they do yeah. tend to over tighten. They wait too long. And if they over tighten, they have to cut by more. In fact, I've said that in my blog repeatedly. The longer the Bank of Canada waits to start cutting, the more likely it is, I think, they're going to have to cut by more. And I think right now, um, uh, I think 12 months from now, we'll look back and say the bank had have waited too long and they over tightened. We won't know that for a while. That is my assessment. Long story short, I mean, we have record levels of debt outstanding at the government and consumer level. And um, policy rates were hiked uh, to their sharpest degree in, in modern history. And right now, um, the Bank of Canada needs to cut probably by its own estimate back to a level of about 3% to get to a neutral position where its policy rate isn't stimulating the economy, but it's no longer restricting the economy. They're at 5% yeah. now. So they got to take 2% off the policy rate. <clears throat> and by the way, if we get a recession, the BOC isn't stopping at neutral. It's going to go below neutral. And that's why the market right now, generally speaking, if you read the mainstream bank economists, and by the way, they don't know any better than anyone else. They're smart and they do a lot of research, but um, they could be wrong too. The general forecast from mainstream economists is that we'll get cuts of anywhere from one and a half to 2% by the end of 2025. And again, no guarantee that'll happen. They don't all agree on that. But if you were to, if you were to read 10 reports from um, uh, chief economists of major banks, I think one and a half to two percent is, and I think it's reasonable to expect that we'll get there. In fact, I think we may well get more. Um, and that'll become clear as we see the next three to four months of economic data to say, hey, was the economy going to, does the economy plateau or does it keep slowing? And I think it's going to keep slowing. So you said by the end of 2025 or the end, not end of 2024? So that's like no. another 18 months. End of 2025. I think I think a year and a half from now, I think the policy rate will be one and a half to two percent below its current level of five percent. And um, yeah, uh, the bank of Canada is. Going to and do you think you think there'll be more potentially more rate cuts this year? Like, yeah. do you think that this will be? Yeah, so. it'll be a lot. If they cut tomorrow, they'll have language that suggests whether or not they're going to, you know, we can expect more rate cuts right away um, or whether they'll 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 want to allow some gaps, maybe every second meeting. I think that's probably what they'll do. They'll probably they Governor Macklin, BOC Governor Macklin has said that people should expect that rates are going to fall slowly. The, the economy will tell him what he needs to do. And, and, and we need to be reminded that he told everybody in 2020 that rates were going to stay low for a long time. And Canadians could be confident of that. So let's not put too much stock in what he says. And yeah, yeah, they exactly. don't want to reignite the housing markets. So, um, so they will probably use strong language to tell people not to get carried away. Um, but the reality is, uh, the economy will dictate what the bank needs to do. And I think the data is going to worsen by more than, than, than the BOC thinks. That's happened so far. The BOC thought we'd see Q1 growth of 2.8. We got 1.7. That's a big difference. Right. Okay. So how do, how do high interest rates affect government 
borrowing. You touched on something there. So because governments borrow money too, right? Yeah, so the, lots of it. It's not just consumers that get affected by these higher rates. How are governments getting pressure, have pressure from these higher rates as well? I'm well, sure. it increases how, how the size important. of their deficit. At some point, the government can't just borrow forever. And all of the money that they have to put towards higher interest costs is money they can't put towards providing services to the public. Um, right now, right. with rates where they are, the Canadian federal government is spending more on mortgage uh, on uh, interest than it spends on health care. And um, uh, that's that's extraordinarily um, uh, expensive. And that, that's that, that's so insane that if you were a household, that just wouldn't make any sense. Right. You know, like if the federal that, government like, was a household, somebody would have come along and cut up their credit cards and uh, they would have been and, bankrupt and already. Down. But they print yeah. money for, you know, they can they can print money. <laughs> um, so. By gold. Um, I, Scott, I, I don't want to lose the other question you asked. Was what what yeah. does this mean for for Canadians? Um, yeah. Ultimately, a quarter point cut is not a big deal. It, it, it doesn't affect fixed mortgage rates directly. The, the, the fixed mortgage rates, as we know, are priced off of government of Canada bond yields. And government of Canada bond yields um, look forward. So basically, the bond market expects the BOC is going to cut rates, and that's already in the price. So unless the BOC cuts by a half a percent tomorrow, or comes out with language that says, you know what, we waited too long, we realized we should have cut rates sooner, we're going to have to really cut now, something that surprises the market that they weren't expecting, that could move government of Canada bond yields. But the bond market has expected BOC rate cuts for some time. So if the BOC cuts by a quarter point tomorrow, it's, it, it shouldn't have a big impact on government of Canada bond yields, which is what drives our fixed mortgage rates. The other thing we always have to remember about GOC bond yields is they follow U.S. Treasuries. So in a week where we get news from Canada that says our economy is weakening and that should push government of Canada bond yields lower, if the Fed announces something or there's a really strong uh, release in the U.S., like a strong employment report or inflation comes in too high and U.S. Treasury yields take off, they're going to pull government of Canada bond yields along with them. And that's something I've warned about in several posts to say – Hey, if you're thinking that fixed rates are going to start falling along with BOC rate cuts that drive variable rates down, you, you need to be warned that the government of Canada bond yields are uh, ride uh, on the coattails of U.S. Treasuries and the U.S. economy right now is on a much different trajectory. They had a debt crisis in 2008 and deleveraged. We didn't do that. They've spent much more of their pandemic savings than we have. The U.S. federal government is actually running a much larger deficit relative to GDP than the Canadian government. They're the ones spending money like drunken sailors. That was the Canadian reputation for quite a while. But right now in the U.S., the U.S. federal government is spending money as if they were in a deep recession and they're still in the middle of, a, of an extended growth period. So the U.S. economy is on a very different trajectory, and that's going to put upward pressure on GOC bond yields and our fixed mortgage rates. For variable rate borrowers, of course, if the BOC cuts by a quarter point, variable rates and lines of credit are going to drop by a quarter of a percent. That isn't in itself a big deal. The thing we don't know, and the thing everybody's debating right now, is when the BOC starts to cut its rate, everybody knows that they're not just going to cut once. And what the market is debating is, Will will this set off a tsunami of pent up real estate demand where there's a whole bunch of people? Any broker will tell you they've done pre approvals for folks who say we're going to wait until rates start to drop and then we're going to get back into the market. We're going to wait till everybody else wants to buy, then we're going to go buy. Right. Basically. Now, when they all have the same idea, it doesn't tend to work yeah. out that way, right? Like they say, be careful what yeah. you wish for, and when everyone thinks one thing's going to happen, something else happens. If everybody is waiting for the market uh, for the BLC to cut and the BLC cuts and everybody runs back into the market, congratulations, you've saved a quarter point on your variable rate, but now you're in bidding wars again and house prices are going up by 5 or 10%. Well, house prices, mortgages are a portion of house prices. If house prices go up by 5 or 10% and you save a quarter of a percent on your variable mortgage rate, you'll wish you'd bought a month ago. And I tell yeah. borrowers, you date your rate and you marry the house. So ultimately, uh, paying a higher mortgage rate, but getting into the market at a good time house price wise and in Toronto, not having to get into bidding wars, that's worth more to you than what you save by waiting for rates to come down if the market changes and you're back to bidding wars because people have to overpay if they want to buy if they're in bidding wars every time they, they go to uh, buy a right. house. And, and we, we know that all this stuff is fun, like it's emotional driven, even though nobody is, we can do the math, but we're still driven by emotion and the emotion of, Hey, we're all going to, we're going to, I'm going to be the smart person and wait till rates get cut. Well, everybody thinks the same thing and that's, it's not going to be a good strategy in general. Right. So, okay. Um, 
And then what about the, what does that do? So if you've done the math, what does it, I'm, you might know this off the top of your head, you can give me an estimate. What does a quarter of a rate cut do mean for $100,000 of, of debt? So somebody's got a variable debt, line of credit, mortgage, and it's a, what is the difference in payment of a quarter percent? Is it like 50 bucks a month or what's the, yeah, uh, well, great question. Um, I don't know that off the top, Scott, but um, like any good mortgage broker, I've got I can You can do the math. I'm just curious for somebody because it's, you know, you can talk about it in actual cash flow terms, right? Yeah. Um, in terms of cash flow on a hundred grand, um, if you're amortizing the loan over 25 years, uh, a rate cut of a quarter point is worth about 25 bucks. 25 bucks on a hundred per hundred grand. Right. Okay. Uh, let's talk about renewals now. So uh, tell me about, have you noticed there's been lots of talk about the renewals being a big part, segment of the market? You said half of them will have still come up for renewal. So in your own mortgage business, are you seeing more renewals and what, what how are you like navigating or stick handling those? Well, I, I have a portfolio. I've been at this for a while now, so I always have renewals coming up and, and, you know, I, I contact every borrower once we get to within 120 days of the renewal date. This is low hanging fruit. If you've done a good job for that borrower, you've already got their application on the system. You copy it over. It takes five minutes to update. Boom, you're back mm -hmm. in business. And again, if you've done a good job for these folks, they're positively disposed towards doing business with you. So I always say to them, first step, let's call your lender and see what rates they're offering. And then we'll compare those rates to the best of what's available elsewhere. The reality is in, in, in about half the cases, the lender offers a good rate and the borrower's best option is to renew with that lender. And if that's the case, I recommended that lender in the beginning. I'm reassuring the borrower that lender's taking good care of you. That's a good rate. And all they have to do is sign back a piece of paper and they've done. Now, I didn't get paid on that deal, but what did I do? I proactively checked in with the borrower. I made sure that they were being treated fairly by the lender that I had recommended to them. And they yeah. know I don't make a buck when they renew with their current lender. And I gave them honest advice. And even though I could have yeah. tried to talk them into something to make a buck, the best option for them was to renew, which I explained to them and I renew them. Now, I didn't get paid on that deal, but that call probably took me 10 or 15 minutes tops. And I'm still uh, going to be positively viewed by those borrowers. There are still potential referrals down the road. They'll for sure call me next time they're up renewal or maybe they're buying a cottage or they're refinancing. So just because I'm not getting paid in that scenario where there's a renewal and they renew with their current lender and there's no trailer fee with that lender and I don't make any money, taking the time to... Uh, demonstrate value, provide honest advice and help that borrower is still well worth the time it takes. That's number one. The other half okay. of the time, not every borrower right now can offer the, the rate, rates that are as good as they were when, when we did the deal back five years ago or three years ago when we did the deal. And in that case, now that they've already gone to their lender and they've got a rate, if I can beat that rate, it's a short conversation. Basically, that lender's rates were really competitive X number of years ago, right now, they're not competitive with the best of what we can get elsewhere. I've got your application copied over in five minutes. We can update the details. I get your application off. We'll get you locked in. This rate will be held for you until your renewal date. People want to know they don't have to give up their awesome rates because pretty much everybody renewing today is renewing into higher rate. And yeah. at the end of the day, um, uh, in, in, in a material number of cases, I can beat the rate and we move the deal. And uh, lenders say they renew 90%. Not, not my experience. Um, you're not going to win them all. And you shouldn't try to win the ones where the best advice is renew with your lender. You should just take the opportunity to serve your clients, provide good advice, yeah. and build your reputation. But it's worth the time. And at the end of the day, yeah, I'm moving deals at renewal because not every lender is as competitive as they used to be. And if you're a broker um, with a pipeline, I'm always amazed. Sometimes people call me and they say, well, I, I had a broker X number of years ago, but they haven't gotten back in touch. So now I'm calling you. And I think to myself, if you're out there hustling for new business, why aren't you jumping all over your renewals? Because it's the lowest hanging fruit you're ever going to get. And again, if you did a good job for the client, uh, why not? I mean, it's, uh, it's kind of a no brainer. Not right. everybody does it. Right. Well, you can think about these renewals. There's two things. You can sometimes get revenue or you can get reputation. Yeah. And both of those things are valuable. And reputation is just revenue potential in the future. The part of the reason that I keep getting you back on the podcast is you've got a great reputation. I mean, you're a good communicator. And so uh, I want to ask about like, is there other strategies on that renewal conversation to be like, is there anything else that you're doing? Do you just go, hey, compare rate for rate? Or do you ask, hey, is there anything that's changed materially like about 
you know, their debt situation or like, cause is there some other things that you, cause it might be that the renewal makes sense, but is there other stuff that you are looking you know, as an advisor, a consultant, what things are yeah. you asking about Absolutely. on that call? I, I, I should have said, Scott, even before I talk about rate and say, call your lender to see what they're offering. The first thing I say is, what do you want to do at renewal? Do you want to just do a straight renewal? Do you want to do a refinance? You've built up equity in your property now. Maybe you want to add a line of credit. Not every lender offers that flexibility. Some of the, some of the lenders that offer the most aggressive insured rates don't do refinances, period. So, or they yeah. do refinances, but the refinance rates are terrible. Um, so establishing what the borrowers want to do at renewal is the first question. Then the second question yeah. is either, well, your current lender could do those things. So let's find out what rates they'll offer you. Or if you want to do a straight renewal, you can go back to your current lender. But if you want to add a line of credit or refinance, that lender doesn't do those things or the rates are much different. So we should look at some other options for you. And again, at the end of the day, the, the, the governing, the guiding principle I use, and if everybody else uses this principle, it will serve them very well is you pretend it's your mom on the other end of the phone and you give them advice the same as if your mom was asking. I put I put that right on the front page of my website. And if you do that, you're doing honest business, you're taking care of people and you're always going to have an excellent reputation. Yeah, and you'll always have a, a, a steady stro stream of clients. Phone so, always rings. But, yeah, and so I, I, I got a couple more questions about this renewal thing. So what are you noticing the term? Because you you get into strategy a bit, I'm sure, with your clients. What terms are you are people primarily selecting that you're noticing? Because, I mean, if I would have talked to you four years ago, it probably would have been a lot of variable rates or some fixed, you know. But what is it today? Is it two and three-year terms? Is it what are people that are coming up for renewal? Right now, I'd uh, say it's it's all either a three-year fixed or a five-year variable. I think if you're conservative, three-year fixed makes the most sense. People don't want to lock in for longer than three years because they think rates are going to come down. When they've spiked to their highest level in more than three decades, the idea of locking in for an extended period of time runs the risk that rates drop. Not only do they drop midterm, and you might not be able to take advantage if your penalty is too high, but... If you got five years on your term and they drop two years from now, you got to hope for the next three years they stay low because rate cycles shift in both directions. And five years is long enough for um, us to go through a rate cut cycle and then be coming up the other side. Back up again. You, be, you, you basically missed the timing on the whole thing. Right. Just, just, so yeah. I think and, and, and in answer to your question, Scott, two year fixed rates are much higher. We're talking one to one and a half percent higher than three year fixed rates. So. I think three or fixed rates are that middle of the fairway safe option. When I talk to borrowers, you're not taking the five. You're paying about a quarter percent premium over five year fixed rates, maybe a little more. Uh, but you're not paying anywhere near the premium you, you pay if you take a one or a two year. And of course, the problem with the one or a two year is you don't know for sure that rates will be all the way down by the time you're up for renewal and you're paying a premium up front and hoping that that premium ends up being worth paying more aggressive borrowers would say, you know what, uh, for example, I've got a small mortgage amount. I've been in a variable rate before, so I understand I can sleep at night with variable rate risk. Uh, the reality is right now, especially if the BOC cuts tomorrow, you can get a variable rate in the high fives. And when you compare that to a three-year fixed rate in the mid to low fives, you don't need a whole lot more rate cuts by the BOC before you draw even with today's fixed rate alternatives. And of course, the BOC typically does cut by anywhere from, well, I put in my most recent post, over the last five rate cut cycles that the BOC has run, and I show a chart in my post, the average drop in the policy rate is 2.35%. That's the average from start to finish, from the first BOC rate cut to the last BOC rate cut. So if you get 2.35% oh, off your 6.2% rate you're starting with today, which is prime minus one, um, you know, you're... You're, you're going to beat any of today's fixed rate alternatives. You're in the high threes at that point. So no guarantee it'll happen. And the timing is everything. If rates don't drop for two more years, you will have paid a premium for a long enough time that rates have to go even lower. That lower rate won't actually cost. help. Think, yeah. But right. most people think the BOC is going to start cutting pretty soon. And if we get anything close to the average uh, of, uh, of 2.35, which is the, the total the BOC has cut on average over its last five rate cut cycles, then um, uh, variable rates will be will, will significantly outperform today's fixed rates. But to be clear, Scott, and I want to make this clear, I don't know what's going to happen. There's a lot of uncertainty out there, and I caution anybody giving mortgage advice. Every time you talk to a borrower about a variable rate, you have to tell them there's risk, 
Nobody knows for sure what's going to happen. There's a lot can, that can change. If, for example, if Iran and Israel start launching nuclear uh, warheads at each other, the price of oil is going to 400 bucks and inflation is going through the roof. Same yeah. thing could happen in, in Ukraine. Um, we could have a massive drought and a, and a, and a food price spike. Um, there are lots of things that can affect inflation and we should never project certainty. People seek that from us. They want us to tell them what to do and they want us to sound sure yeah. when we do it, but we don't have that certainty. And we need to be responsible about when people trust us for our advice, we need to tell them, hey, I can't see around corners. This is my assessment. They want that. Um, but there's risk and you have to advise them of that. Certainly, when people were taking variable rates at one and a half, nobody thought they'd go to 6%. And if you were giving honest advice at one and a half, then your conscience is clear. It breaks your heart that people are paying so much more. But if you gave responsible advice, then then you can't blame yourself. Uh, the borrowers. It breaks my heart that I put myself in variable rate mortgages because I'm like, hey, it it wins 95 percent of the time until it doesn't. You know, I'm right. like, man, every smart mortgage broker goes variable except when the market, you know, when this happens. And and when it's been more than 30 years since the last time variables gone through the roof, uh, most of us weren't alive. Uh, well, weren't active uh, in the in the. In, in the I wasn't world. alive 30 years ago, but and I'm sure you were too. It's so easy we were both, to forget. But yeah, we weren't. Yeah. So it's again, easy to forget. Yeah. Nothing wrong with an opinion, I, I, but make sure people know it's an opinion and nobody knows for sure. Yeah. I like the way you frame that and that you use data. So, uh, and the fact that you, you are very clear about the fact that you're, you're not trying to provide certainty. You're just trying to provide content. I'd say you're providing context to make decisions, but you're not providing certainty that you can't give them. Yeah. So it's like, well, it's like, a, it's like a, it's like a physician saying, Hey, we can do this operation and, your the odds of success are Y X, or we can do this one and it's Y. And here's what the, that looks like. But I can't. They don't even. They won't tell you that it's 100. percent They're going to tell you that this works and there's a this percent chance that you will die in the procedure. Right. Would you or, like to or like more similar to what we do? You call your stockbroker and you say, "What do you think of this stock?" And the broker offers an opinion of the stock. They're not going to tell you with certainty that it's going to go up in value or what the price is going to rise to. They'll give you an opinion based on their expertise. Anybody giving an opinion on where rates are headed should be reading about this stuff for an hour or two every day. You better do your homework. But if you've done your homework and you have an opinion, even if you don't get it right, if you're quoting stats and you're talking about the BOC's latest monetary policy report and you read the Globe and Mail every day and you know you find good information on the internet to inform your opinion and stay on top of that stuff, you can, you can credibly call yourself uh, uh, an educated opinion and um, uh, people will will sense that they'll, they'll, and, and they'll value that even if you don't get it right. Yeah. And I think that like, I just thought of this, like your tagline, we don't, I don't provide certainty, I provide context to help you make better decisions. And so like, that is ultimately what it comes down to for you. So uh, let me ask you this. If you were to look at your last, say 20, 10 or 20 files that you did, and you may not know this off the top of your head, but what percent of them would you say fall into the three year fixed versus the five year variable? And again, every client, I know that we're not, I'm just getting, a, I just want to get a sense of, and I, I also want to pref, con, put, provide context that I suspect your database is not first time buyers. It's probably people that are, you know, they're into their multiple mortgage life cycle. And so they're a bit more financially, it's not like it's, so yeah, what how, what would you estimate right now is sort of you're seeing the split? Well, on your own first of all, I, I do work with home, uh, first time home buyers, but I probably skew a little bit more towards second and third time buyers in part because a lot of my business comes from the GTA. I do business across most provinces, but um, but a lot of it comes from the GTA and, and that tends to uh, end up being more second and third time buyers. I just took a quick glance at my pipeline while you were asking me the question. I'm about two thirds three year fixed and about one third variable right now. I suspect that'll flip after the BOC's first rate cut. Most people taking three year fixed rates a month or two ago had no confidence based on the language out of the BOC and the Fed if they were following this stuff that rate cuts were imminent. I think one of the changes we'll see is after the first quarter point by the BOC rate cut, uh, or first uh, quarter point cut by the BOC, um, I think the five-year variable rate will become the pretty girl at the prom, and uh, I suspect we'll all be doing a lot more variables. Uh, after that. <laughs> yeah, she didn't never talk to me, man. When I was in school, I was like the pretty girl at the prom. I was like, oh, who's that guy? <laughs> um, okay, so I want to ask last little thing. I want to wrap up with is so you talked about. I think I love that you provide that your whole philosophy around your clients is treat them like your mom. So like, how would I advise my mom? But and you do a hundred. What other things are you doing to keep your database so they don't forget about you? Because it's one thing you pick up clients from other mortgage brokers who are obviously not maybe they did a good job but they're not what 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 is the cycle of communication and or strategy so that when that three years comes up they're like oh dave is my go-to I, I know it's not just a call so what is yeah. it emails is it like what does that look like 
Well, they know I write a blog and some of them subscribe to my blog, which means they get a weekly email from me. Um, but a lot of folks um, uh, don't subscribe. And for those guys, what I do is every year in the anniversary date of their mortgage, I send them a quick email called their annual checkup. And I basically say, hi, so-and-so, here's what's happened with rates since we did your mortgage. It's been another year and I wanted to check in with me, check in with you. Your rate of X um, is either higher or lower than the best currently available rates that I have in the market. And either my advice is to stay put because the cost to break your mortgage and refinance uh, wouldn't be covered by any potential savings you would realize, or uh, you're still getting the best deal. Uh, and my advice is to stay put for the time being. Or, and by the way, reminding people they got a fabulous rate of 2% and now rates are way higher. And, and my advice is- It makes you put. look like a rock star. Yeah, by right? the way, remember that wicked rate we did? Here's a quick email. And again, it's not long, but it says, yeah. here's what's happened with rates. If it turns out that I can save them money, I do a, an automated spreadsheet, which says, here's your rate, here's the penalty, here's how much you'll save, here's your here's the potential savings. And I say, I've attached this spreadsheet that shows you how much you might save. Um, if you want to learn more, give me a call. And then I say, if you're interested in my latest blog post, offering my take on whatever it is I'm talking about. And this uh, past week, I did a fixed versus variable comparison. Those are pretty popular. I used three simulations, one where variable proves cheaper, one where fixed ends up being cheaper, and one where they break even to give people an idea of... of, of what Provide context way. back to right. like... So you pick yeah. which one you think is the most likely, but here's scenarios. And if this happens, it's because the economy does this. And if this happens, it's because the economy does that. But I put, so the email is, hello, Here's your rate compared to the best one I have available. Either let's talk or you're still getting the best deal. Here's a link to my latest blog post. If you want to contact me, my details are in the signature below. If I don't hear from you, I'll check back with you in another year's time. Or if there's one year left, I'll check back with you as soon as we're within 120 days of your renewal date. I'm not offering them gardening tips. I'm not wishing them happy birthday. I'm not bothering people with spam emails. And by the way, I say spam emails. Everybody's got their approach. Some people who communicate more regularly with their client base, do well by it. But in my experience with my clients, once, it doesn't work. It doesn't match your personality and your wiring and like just how you like it makes sense. You just well, do yeah. what works for you. Yeah. They can call me anytime they want. And my turnaround time when an existing client calls me, they go straight to the front of the line and they get a call back in 10 minutes because I want them to know that even though I'm not getting paid on a deal in the moment, they're still valuable to me and I'm still their broker. But in terms of proactively, once a year, in my experience, works great. And, and, and a couple of things happen. I often get a nice email back saying, I'm so glad you checked in and that you're keeping an eye on this for us. Um, you know, it's great to hear from you. I've talked to you in a year. Uh, sometimes they tell me they had a baby or they give me some personal information. So we have a chance for a quick connection. Um, and a lot of times, Scott, if I send out 20 of those emails, lo and behold, within a day or two, I get a referral from somebody who's a friend of one of those people who happened to mention they were looking for mortgage advice. And that email I sent to them where I didn't even ask for a referral. I just gave them a little bit of value and that was the end of it. I get referrals from those emails all the time. They're so easy to send. I send them one by one. I don't have an automated process because I don't want to. I was going to ask, how long do they take to you to make? I mean, you, you're probably pretty fast at this, but if you're to make one of those for your clients, what's how long does it take? You know, there's a lot of copy and pasting. If I sit down for probably half an hour or 45 minutes, I can send out 50 of those emails. And I'm talking about individual emails. They're not done through any spam uh, or sorry, not spam, through any um, automated um, engine system. because I worry it's all, it's all get picked yeah, up in spam right. folders. And I also worry that something about it would make it seem not genuine. So I do send them individually, but if I can send, well, you send them one to one, you actually don't, minutes. you don't put them on a list. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. And if I get, if I, if I send 50 emails and I get one referral based on the average amount of what we get paid in a commission on a single deal, time well spent. And, and even yeah. if I don't get the phone, sometimes I get more than one or the, the client calls me and we end up refinancing or they say, and they say, Hey, actually, thanks for the email, but I actually need a refi or I want to take money out or, or like I've it been just prompts to call them. You. We're thinking of buying a cottage. You know, it's just yeah. another, it's another check in. And again, I'm not begging you for business or asking you for referrals. I'm demonstrating value. I'm reminding you in the, in the recent context of the awesome rate we got for you, which is now no longer available unless it's variable, in which case, you know, sometimes they call me and they're concerned. What's my payment going to be at renewal? Uh, how much higher can variable go? What happens if the bank kind of raises by another half percent? Those are all conversations I've had all the way up. So even the borrowers who went variable and wish they'd gone fixed, 
still know that they can get in touch with me anytime they want to. And in conversations that we've had, a lot of times the fear of the boogeyman is worse than staring the boogeyman in the eye. And when we sit down and we talk about what future increases will look like, what the impact will be, it's relief. Because now a fear that was unknown is now known. And it, it's, it's still something they're concerned about, but now they can, they, they have a context around it and they can put real numbers and they're not just thinking the sky's going to fall. Right. That's so good. Where can people follow your blog? Well, uh, anyone types in the name David the Rock into Google, they'll find my, my blog and there's a subscribe button up at the top right corner and you just put your email in there and hit subscribe and then you're on the, you're on the list. You get them uh, every Do morning. you have many people on that list? If you mind me asking, like how is that a pretty good sized list? Cause you've been blogging for a long time. Yeah, I've been doing those Monday. You know what, Scott? I've been doing those Monday morning updates now for 14 years, and they're about man, a thousand, that's crazy. They're about thousand to fifteen hundred words each, and I figure now. I mean, I I take a little time off at Christmas, and once in a while I go on vacation, but I think I'm sending about 45 of them a year. So we're up to probably 700 to 800 of those posts. The other thing, by the way, writing a post like that in detail. And researching throughout the week and sitting down to to gather your thoughts and articulate them. Anyone calls me and talks to me on the phone. You know, when you and I are talking today, I didn't prepare. You didn't have a note or anything. No. If you're not watching. If you can't see the like on YouTube, you see the video. But there's literally this is all because you have been putting this in your mind over the last right. week of all the data and stuff. So it's like it's really easy for you to talk exactly. about. Exactly. And you're sharpening yeah. your your skates when you when you write these posts and when you think about this stuff and you do this research. So it's top of mind all the time and it's second nature. And again, doing right. the posts takes a lot of work. But if you want to differentiate yourself in the market, you got to be willing to put in the work. And and sometimes you know talent and skill only take you so far. Sometimes. You know, as a runner, um, you got to be willing to go out there when it's pouring rain or freezing cold and, and, and get your work in and uh, it pays off over time. Yeah. And we got another podcast you and I did where we talked about this was quite a while ago where because I've been doing this for 10 years now. The podcast is coming for 10 years in July. And we did one where we broke down what your whole blogging strategy was. And you're still doing it like it's been I mean, you were doing it for a long time then. So I'll, I'll put a link to that show. So people go back and listen to that one. And because uh, I think that's interesting, man. Thank you, Dave, for coming to chat with me. I really appreciate it. And this, as always, it's uh, I always learn a lot. Great talking to you. Thanks for having me. Hey, thanks again for listening. And if you want to do me a solid, here's what I would encourage you to do is one, go get on Dave's blog list and follow his stuff and consume it. He spends a lot of time researching it and creating it. And if you want to be an educated mortgage broker, and it's literally free, there's going to, it's going to cost you nothing. Two, if you know Dave or if you I send him a note, say, hey, man, thanks for coming to share. I really, you know, when we get guests like Dave on here and he takes time away from his business, and obviously it's not a paid thing for him. He just does it because he likes to share. You'd sending him a note of like, hey, I appreciate you. I saw that. I saw what you did. Uh, it goes a long way. And I, that would mean a lot to me if you did that. And I mean, I tell him thank you, but it'd be cool if you could say thank you if you found this valuable because I know that I did. And the last thing I'm going to ask you is if you find this show useful to you and, you know, I haven't asked for this in a while, but if you could go leave a review, that would really help me out. Spotify is only in the last little while has started allowing reviews on there. So go leave us a review. That would be awesome. More people find the show if you do that. And yeah, just thanks for listening. And as I always say, there's no problem in your mortgage business that hasn't already been solved. Your problem is that who's already solved it and how do I get their answer? And the whole purpose of this show is to help you find some of those answers. Thanks for listening. And I will see you on the next show.